Thank you all for being here today. I'm going to try not to get in front of the screen, but I tend to be, I've I got the legs of John Madden. I kind of want to walk around and be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So it's going to be a challenge for them to get all of them, you know, all of my chins on camera. So we'll make sure we get that out there. So we're going to try to make this as uh, kind of mutually exclusive terms, cost accounting and somewhat entertaining if we possibly can. Um, I think it's always important to have fun with anything you're doing in finance. Uh, a quick little extra background on me. I'm a statistician, don't hate. But I mean, that, that's been my role all along. I was an analytics person before they came up with the term analytics. I got literally hired at Methodist Hospital in Houston as a statistician. And then they didn't know what they want. They just knew they needed one. But that was 41 years ago. Um, when I'm not doing this, and he knows this, uh, and Rena knows this, and maybe I might slip into a little bit of Elvis. You know, toward the end of the day, we might see. But we're going to talk. We're going to thank you very much. We're going to talk about cost accounting, though, um, and activity-based cost accounting specifically. And though Michael Lowe said, you know, you can ask questions for those that are in, in, in the room at the end. Feel free to ask them when it comes up. So I, you know, I'm not in too much of a cadence, but I can't do this. So a quick agenda. Um, challenges I'm seeing across the country and frankly around the world um, uh, for healthcare systems. We think, or at least I've seen, that activity-based costing gives you a, an opportunity to really accelerate your financial performance. And I got some case studies to prove it and some sample reports to prove it. And so that's where I'm going to head with that. And then it does say questions at the end, but as I mentioned, please. Please ask me questions as you see fit. So, you know, four years ago, this slide would never have been in my slide deck. Um, these two folks right here, Amazon and Walmart, are now in the top three in terms of employing physicians and pharmacists in the United States. So, you know, we always want to talk about growing our outpatient business and. Um, you know, my son lives in Ventura, California, and he uh, is on Kaiser Insurance. He telehealths with his physician, and they automatically order his prescriptions on Amazon, and it had a drone drop it on his front door. So he didn't have to, he didn't have to go out when he was under the weather, or think of, I think of my daughter who has a baby, you know, two-year-old now, but not having to take the child and put it in a car so he can go out. So they're eating up market share. And we heard the previous talk about market share. You know, you've got C, you know, CVS buying Aetna. You've got the whole teledoc thing, which is never going away. But the point is, you've got the pressures on your revenue that you've never really had from any of this four years ago, quite frankly. So if you're losing revenue, the only way to keep margin, my math brain thinks, is you've got to reduce cost. And I mean, there's no, I don't think it's ever a bad thing as long as it's the right thing, as long as it's tactical to reduce costs, and I'll give you some stories around that. And so I kind of am preaching to the choir here, but you know, I just talked about you're losing volume because of this slide. You're seeing payer shifts to more vertically integrated. I saw, I had put Boeing on there on purpose. Um, there are a lot of, uh, my daughter is uh, with the Chamber of Commerce in Houston. She's their event coordinator. And she talked about how there's a lot of vertical integration between Chevron, Exxon, Mobil are all directly contracting with Memorial Hermann Methodist, Texas Children's Hospital, no insurance. They're, they're, they're handling it themselves. And so you're going to see that. Um, we'll certainly touch about this. You know, I've got some new interesting stories that I've just heard recently on labor productivity at vis-a-vis uh, -vis the whole contract labor piece. Um, of course, this wasn't on here two years ago, but now we've got to be very transparent and we've got to make sure we're doing all the right things. If we're having trouble getting volume, we better make sure we're capturing all of our charges and capturing all of our potential revenue that we can possibly do. And frankly, I think this, of all of these, might be the easiest one to solve. You're not messing with people, which is usually a political thing, but you can, if you can cut cost in the supply chain area, great. Now, having said all that, and through the introduction, talked about I have only, I'm a wide man with a narrow focus. 
I have only done cost accounting and budgeting for 39 <laughs> years now. Um, and this is what, you know, I always used. And to me, it's the four A's that make things tough for y'all, really tough. You can get the y'all, you can tell them from Texas. Um, assumptions, approximations, allocations, and averages. Virtually every cost accounting tool I've ever worked with, as accurate as it wanted to be, was still an average. Even if you gave, you put Mike Andrews in, 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 into the room and watched them do EKGs for three straight days and stopwatched it. I don't know if that's the best three days of their lives or the worst three days of their lives to do the, to do the EKG, but they have, it's an average that I'm coming back with 17 minutes based off all of my three days of observation. And that's what goes into the cost accounting system. So that every patient that gets an EKG, it's costed at 17 minutes and whatever the supplies are, and we can talk about the supplies separately based off my, what I was noticing that the supplies that were being, there's not a lot of supplies to an EKG, but you get the point. Or it's the average drug cost of metformin for all the diabetic patients for whatever the price was for that month or that six months or that 12 months. And oh, by the way, most cost accounting systems, I, I could ask questions, but I'm not gonna get, get I don't wanna make people liars. Um, most cost accounting systems the finance department updates the RVUs or the standards maybe in an exceptional hospital every six months. Most of the time a year, sometimes it's 18 months now. So that's older data. So now, if think about that and the averages for a moment. And the, and the story I, I will equate it to outside of healthcare is how many people in the room are parents? Show of hands. Can you imagine if you went to, to go to meet the teacher with your child's second grade teacher and she starts it off by saying, hi, I'm Mr. Andrews and I've just decided this year that I'm just giving everybody for every single assignment a B. That's a good average grade. Everybody's getting a B. Whether they do better or whether they do worse, everybody's getting a B. Not many parents would be very happy with Mr. Andrews. Yet, we're making decisions on contract modeling with United Healthcare and with Blue Cross for per case and per diem and for bundles based off of average costs. The statistician in me hates too strong a word, was very unhappy with that, but there was really nothing technologically that could be done in the, in, certainly in the 80s, not really even in the 90s. I would read Harvard Business Review studies about you know somebody who came in and did a you know time-based activity-based costing but it was still they were doing the stopwatch bit and it was still whatever their time frame they're looking at it it wasn't I'm doing it for each individual patient as they come in and, and you know and what's going on with them and even then even if they did that each individual patients how much time it was spent then they'd have to court you know the, the more maybe more important thing is correlating who was the person doing it was it the senior EKG tech was it a, you know EKG Tech 1, differences in labor price. And of course, the other thing that, you know, would get under my skin would be that it was all cost accounting was being done based off things you charged for. And there's a lot of activity, direct patient activity, that's non-chargeable. And that's never being considered, oh, it's a fixed cost. It's never being considered. So I'm gonna give you some examples to kind of get your mind to think about that. And so, you know, now we've got, everything's, like, everything's documented, everything's electronic. So we can get at some of this stuff now. We can get a lot of this stuff and really start getting after what's going on. So what I've seen is, you know, folks wanting to try to then say, oh, now that we got this EMR data and we got all this great data, we can, put, we can apply a manufacturing cost accounting principle to it. And I'll just say right now, no. Because manufacturing, you know, if I'm at Ford Motor Company, you know, today we're putting on you know, hubcaps and steering wheels, and all the cars come through, and maybe they're, they're leather steering wheels, or maybe they're spinner hubcaps, but it's the same process. But if we take these three patients, let's pretend all three got meniscus surgery, as an example. You know, I'm gonna be patient two with hair. Um, uh, we'll make Marnie patient three, and you get to be patient one. So you've gone through your primary care physician, who referred you to an orthopod, who finally said, yep, let's schedule the surgery. So you've got a way of, that you've showed up at the hospital. I was in an auto wreck a 
coming off the 405 and I-5 exchange trying to get back to the airport. And so I was taken straight through the ED to get ready for mine. Marnie, you know, she's got the, she got the looks like workout kind of stuff to her. So she's been working out. She had a sports injury. And so through sports, went to, went to Google. There you go. And so you're, you're coming in through this way and you're there for that. So all three are getting a meniscus surgery, but all three have gotten there differently. So I don't think we can really apply manufacturing, but I still want to be able to know the differences in cost for that meniscus surgery for the three of us. So here's what I run up against. As I've kind of talked about, the cost accounting systems that have been in place for years, the only difference in the costs are if there's differences in utilization. So let's go back to the meniscus surgeries for the three of us. Marnie's local. She got the chief of orthopedics to work on her. But guess what? The chief of orthopedics has a veteran OR nursing staff who get paid a whole lot more money per hour than me coming through the ED who they didn't know, but I probably have a much higher anesthesia person because they're looking at this and saying, oh my, di diabetic and, you know, portly at best. Um, and then, you know, you're like down the middle. You're not, you're Goldilocks. You're not too big, you're not too small, you're just right. Um, so, but for all of y'all, if we all three had 59 minute surgeries, in every other cost accounting system I've seen for the last 35 years, we would all three have the same cost for the OR portion. And then, you know, our cost for our nursing would be based off where we are at midnight, because where it's on charges, it's the midnight census. Doesn't make any difference that I was in the ICU for 21 hours, but they moved me at 10 o'clock at night. And then I'm in, a, I'm in three west then, I get charged for a regular room instead of the ICU and all that extra utilization and all that extra resource for me, never known. What I'm starting to see folks doing, and I've, I've seen this in about eh, 75 hospitals so far around the country, as they're doing actual activity-based costing for each individual patient as if the individual patient was the only patient they had. So now how do you do that? Well, first off you say, I'm glad we have a charge master, I want a bill but we're gonna tap into that EMR because that EMR knows exactly who the nurses were at in and out times in the OR, exactly who the two people it took to get me up on the table to do my knee x-ray, whereas you two only needed one. That's transportation people, that's non-chargeable, but that's activity. I'll keep throwing myself slightly under the bus. I had post-operative sickness, so I threw up three times in my room I had to have housekeeping come clean my room three times. Y'all didn't have to have that happen. That's extra cost directly related to my case, what's happening to me. All of that is documented. In fact, down to the fact that, that for you, the, you were up on 8th North, and that's a long ways for the phlebotomist to come over and do a, a blood draw just to make sure everything's okay. There was no post-operative infection, you know. So the head nurse came down, Jimmy, and did your phlebotomy. Well, guess what? Jimmy gets paid a whole lot more than the phlebotomist does. And oh, by the way, by doing that, it takes away from Jimmy's nursing productivity because Jimmy doesn't get credit for that in most productivity or of all productivity systems, quite frankly. And we need to know, is that always happening on 8 North? Because the phlebotomist can't get up there. Maybe we should put a phlebotomist up there and they cover 7, 8, and 9. But knowing that, unlocks what each individual patient's cost is. Now then you can add them up, just like we've been doing for years, and we heard a presentation on service line just a little bit ago. And we can start looking at, well, how are we doing on gallbladders? How are we doing on C-sections? How are we doing on, you know, hysterectomies? How are we doing on cardiac caths? I just saw in Houston, I was visiting my grandson and my daughter, and, and uh, uh, CHI St. Luke's is outpatient angioplasties. And I'm just like, you know, so, as these things happen, you know, you, you, we got to be able to get at these costs. And so I think, you know, three pillars that I look for is that the cost has to, it can't, it has to strengthen your overall decision support. You've still got to go out and try to collect the money. You've still got to make sure you're doing good on, on your contract negotiation, which I think I can show you where we can help there. Um, and by we, I mean activity-based costing. It's got to be trustworthy. And what I have found 
is that when I approach clinicians and it's not charge code data, it's actually stuff in the EMR, it's actual activity, they're a little bit less hesitant to come at you and say, oh, it's not, my patients are different, this is not my data, I, I don't know what this charge means, it's, it's an OR pack, I just use what I use. That was my imitation of a, you know, an old grovelly physician. And then it's great, I mean, I'm sitting here promoting the juice, but if the squeeze is too hard, what's the relative value of that? Getting, what's the relative value of getting rid of relative value units? Um, you've got to be able to do it pretty fast. Um, so it's got to really be automated in my book. And I, I was working with uh, one of the first places I saw do this was UPMC up in Pittsburgh. And they have 40 hospitals and uh, there are 650 uh, physician offices around the greater Pittsburgh area. And they're closing their cost accounting and getting reports out monthly within a day and a half after the GL closes with one and a half people because they've automated all this. It's all automated because their EMR data is coming in daily and they're getting this data in daily. All they're waiting for is the two bi-weekly payrolls to come through and the GL to close and let financial accounting take care of that and the data kind of flows to itself. Um, I will, since I brought them up, I'm gonna, uh, I, I, piggybacking on some things I heard over there, um, we're talking about physician productivity and trying to get maximize the use of your exam rooms. One of the things they had is they had 1,100 physician offices. And so they, you know, so, <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, and so they started looking at like, Dr. Smith had five exam rooms, was using three. Dr. Jones, three miles away in Dr. Jones' office, she had three exam rooms using two. So they got Jones to move in with Smith, utilized all five rooms, got rid of the lease payment for Jones's office, and they did this right as COVID was starting. And just in lease payments alone, they showed us that they would save seven and a half million dollars annually in lease payments by going from 1,150 to 650 offices. And then to just be sure, because they had all that, they got all that rich EMR and EHR data, they looked at the zip codes of the patients that were going to Smith and to Jones to make sure that some of them weren't, because you know, in some cases they took people 10 miles away and put those two doctors together or three doctors together or whatever that it, this wasn't gonna be a burden on patients to have to drive too much farther. And actually they, they think that they kind of even help that to a certain extent. But the point is, you've got all this data that you can use from an analytics perspective. As long as the, there's not too much squeeze to do the juice. So I'm, I, I promised some case studies. This is a pretty interesting one. It's for hysterectomy. And this came about, and you can see that the, the case volumes across the top are pretty, other than laparoscopic, are pretty, you know, they're, they're certainly statistically sampled big enough, no problems there. They put in a robot to do robotic hysterectomies, and they took some of the volume away. A robot vendor came to them the second year and said, I think you need to buy another robot. And they were able to run the cost accounting against this, the actual cost, including allocating a piece of the robot to each individual patient that had the robot, allocating the depreciation, for, for lack of a better word, and the maintenance. And we found that G doing the robotic is $1,500 higher in cost than the laparoscopic and $2,400 higher than vaginal. Now it's still $1,000 cheaper than the open, so you know, half full, half empty. Should we get another robot and eliminate, completely eliminate the, the open? Well, we would save some money there. But guess what? Look at the margins. And this goes into the revenue. That's why you gotta look at this from a holistic perspective. They were getting paid a per diem for the open and a per case for the robot. Well, the robot, the, the, the opens have a longer length of stay, so huh, guess what? They get more revenue because it's per diem. And not that we want to keep patients in the hospital longer. We want to be good stewards of them and of us. But actually, you can see the loss was better for the open than the robotic. So they came to this with the, to the, to the robotic vendor and said, well, you know, you're hiring cost. Um, I don't know if we want to get into the robot. And so the robotic vendor, right off their script, well, you know, our outcomes are better. Now, here's the thing. Virtually everybody's cost accounting system historically, besides being averages, are in a silo. 
It doesn't integrate with your clinical data. So for them to be able to go out and prove or disprove, you look slightly different. Um, <laughs> disprove or, or prove the hypothesis of, gee, uh, we're, we have better outcomes. They're gonna have to get a clinical analyst or somebody from your analytics department and they're gonna have to download all the patients and put them in an access database and then get all the cost accounting data and put it in an access database and somebody's gonna have to audit it and make sure everybody met. But if you're tapped into your EMR and it's not charge based, then it took them about an hour and a half, the same one and a half people that did the closest from UPMC by the way, same one and a half people and they came back with them and said, well you know what? Yeah, you're better than open, everything's better than open, but your 30 day readmits no better, you're the second worst. Your complications is the second worst. The transfusion, you're the second worst. So we just have to make a decision. Do we want to completely eliminate open? Or do we want to go to a, you know, a per case on open, which would really make us want to get rid of it? Or, and buy another robot, or are we going to say, you know, the one robot for now is good. You know, so. The point is they had the clinical and the financial data. That's where I think about strengthening the decision support. It's not just financial decision support, it's clinical decision support. So then I think to myself, this is another one of my favorite case studies, lumbar spinal fusion, 850 cases, plenty of cases there. Every cost accounting system that I've ever seen will come up with a number of what the total cost is, 18,220. Now I could say that those that are using activity-based, that number is probably more precise than whatever you come up with the average, but we'll set that argument aside. The problem is, for those, those that are using averages, again, unless there's utilization differences, there's no way to show any variation. Everybody comes out the same unless there's just more utilization or less utilization. It doesn't take into that price of utilization when I talked about the phlebotomy and the she having, Marnie having, you know, a more expensive OR staff, me having to have people help me up onto the bed, me throwing up three times. But notice the consumption drivers that people are using for activity-based costing, things you don't generally think about, and I've brought some of these up, not the room charges, the time they were in the bed, the case minutes, room to room, things of that ilk. And look at this variation. And this, I mean, I'm glad I'm not on the provider side when I see this. Because if I'm trying to negotiate with United Health, how the heck am I going to negotiate that when I'm anywhere from 9,000 to 27,000? And I don't know. I mean, now I know. And I mean, I can then start looking at it. Is it, you know, is it only Dr. Smith or is it systemic that they're all over the place? The other thing I, I, I like about this case study is that it really, you know, the first thing people want to lock in on is nursing. It's only 14% of the cost here. It's got 150% variation, that's scary as can be. But it's only 14% of the cost. You're still, a lot of it's here in supplies and blood and drugs. So I will tell you a story from a, a hospital that I was working with, it was in, I almost said Louisiana. Louisiana, be nice, Mike. Um, and they were doing, they had eight ophthalmologists that did cataract surgeries. 95% Medicare. Medicare pays about $900 for the procedure. We looked, took a look at the cost, and they were ranging anywhere from about $450 total to $1,300 amongst the eight ophthalmologists. Looked at it by ophthalmologist, and that range was pretty much there for three out of the eight. The other five were really close to about $500, and they were very, but the other three were. Sometimes they were 400, sometimes they were 1300. So we dig into the whole bit and the surgical services were almost identical for everyone. Almost every single patient had a 30 minute surgery. Almost every single patient had a 30 minute recovery room. Almost every single patient had the same eye drops from a drugs perspective. And they were outpatient and went home so there wasn't really other than recovery room nursing time. But Amongst the eight ophthalmologists, there were six different lenses being used. That ranged anywhere from $275 to $900. And guess what? Dr. Andrews not only used the $275, he used the $900. And so we were able to show them there was no difference in readmit rates, there was no complication differences, 
And hey, Dr. Andrews, why are you using one that's this way and one that's this way? You, I'm sure you're, you're very happy with your quality. Oh, yes, 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 I am. I'm very happy with my quality of my lenses that I'm using on my patients. Well, why are you using it? Well, I know both lens vendors. I, I used to use one, and this one came along, and I didn't know the price. I just knew it was a good lens. I, they gave me a trial. I used it. I told my colleagues, a couple of them are using it. Well, yeah, yeah, we know. Three out of the eight of y'all are using that one every now and then. It's 900. So we found out that there were 500 surgeries during 2020, 2019, excuse me, that were used using the $900 lens. So we got them all to standardize on the $275 lens and then that lens vendor dropped it down to 225 because now they were purchasing more in bulk because there were some lens prices in between that some of them were using. So, you know, do the math of, I'll just say $600 times, it was 300 grand. Nobody's changing the OR schedule. Nobody's getting rid of a nurse. Nobody's changing anything. The patient's outcomes are, are exactly the same. And we just dropped 300,000 to the bottom line without making any major changes. Instead of reaching over here on the shelf for the lens, I'm reaching right here on the shelf for the lens. And that's where I, I talked about up front, that it's getting this idea of supply and drug, which is an easier political thing to, to go after than necessarily labor. But I'm finding, and, and I, I think I've proven this out in a number of places I've been, it's we don't want, we shouldn't rush to compare Dr. Andrews to Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones. Compare Dr. Andrews to Dr. Andrews. There is enough low hanging fruit in virtually every service line where I as the physician am not homogeneous in terms of my care for a particular diagnosis. That if we can just get me to be homogeneous to my gallbladders, or me to be homogeneous to do my C-sections, or to treat pneumonia, then there's enough there that maybe then we can start talking benchmarking, and then we can start talking comparing me to Dr. Smith. Because if you go in with that, that to begin with, then there's a lot of resistance. But if you just say, hey, I'm just looking at your patients with you, and you know, tell me why this is so different. The same secondary diagnosis are there, I don't understand. Especially in the ambulatory surgery area. So now, I'm better armed if I have this, and maybe it's made me more scared, as I mentioned earlier, to try to negotiate from a contract management perspective. But I'm also much better armed in terms of where am I going to go after my variation? You know, where am I doing things untoward? And I want to be able to get down to, you know, the blades, the, the, the pieces and parts, especially in surgery. You know, as an example, let's say there's, let's say for gallbladders, there's an OR pack that was developed with the surgeons to, you know, this is what we think, there's, there's five instruments that we use and we put in the pack, we all agreed upon it. And Dr. Andrews used, opens up two packs, I like saying two pack, but that's another guy. Um, Dr. Andrews opens up two packs for every surgery and Dr. Smith just opens one. But I'm able to find out if I'm really using what the OR data from the EMR or from a separate OR system, that I, though I open two packs, I'm using five out of five out of the first pack and four out of five out of the second pack. And my quality of my, my gallbladder surgeries are just fine. Dr. Smith is opening a one pack and only using two out of the five. Well, who's got more waste? It may be Dr. Smith, who's letting three instruments or three pieces of the pack not be used, where I'm using five out of five and four out of five. Now granted, it's two charges, but from a utilization perspective, I'm getting good outcomes and I'm using it. The point is being able to know that and being able to, you know, identify that and then maybe having, then maybe having that conversation. Would you like to talk to Dr. Smith? Because Dr. Smith only needs to use one pack and it's only two instruments. And then whether that is fruitful or not, at least I know where I've got my issues and my bumpers in my bowling lane so I don't throw, keep throwing gutters, you know, that way. So I, I want to be able to get at that data. And I mean, when I mean get at that data, I know this is going to be, you can't read it, but I mean, we're down to sutures. We're down to things that are, again, non-chargeable in supplies. What's going on with that patient for that particular case type? So that we can know where we stand individually. And I've said service line, but you know what? From a, from a social determinants of health, are we treating our Medicaid patients differently for a particular case type? Are we treating our elderly diabetic men 
diagnosis aside, differently for a gallbladder. We can be able to prove or disprove any allegations or assertions or hypotheses around that. And then, of course, we always want to be able to do, I should probably see where I am on time. I'm okay. Um, we want to look at our margins, and we want to look at them by, you know, a variety of things, payer, diagnosis. I have a client in San Antonio, right near where I live, and uh, San Antonio is 75% Catholic. And they came to me and said, Mike, we're trying to figure out, we've been asked by one of the sisters at our, and it's Catholic hospital, they wanted, for lack of a better term, market share by Monsignor. They, in essence, wanted to know that when a patient registers, if they give them the big C for Catholic on the religion, then they actually built into the registration system a drop-down box of a list of all the Catholic churches in San Antonio. And then they go, oh, what church do you go to? St. Mark's. Fine, boom. Maybe not Mark's with Russia. Uh, uh, St. Okay, that works. Okay, fine. Um, and so they were able to, because they have all that rich data, literally run patients and see if they're... And one of the things they found, which I thought was, you know, I, I tell this story kind of to get a smile, but they wanted to see because they had <laughs> a 42% C-section rate at their hospital, which is absurdly high. Should never be higher, much more higher than 25% tops. And what it was is they had a whole lot of patients that were presenting themselves that were, uh, had never been to an obstetrician. I'll, I'll try to keep the politics out of it, but they were in San Antonio and they'd never been into an obstetrician, but they immediately could identify what church they were going to. And so the hospital figured out that if they could put like a mobile van with an obstetrician one day a week at St. Mark's with prenatal drugs and then the priest being there to say, it's okay, no, no, no nothing's gonna happen both medically and police-wise to you, get treated, they were able to drop it down to about 30% within six months. But that's why they asked me the question, or they asked the hospital the question and came to me, what do we, how do we need to, to play it? Came, so you've gotta be able to get it. And now, let's go back to the, the Boeing example, we wanna be able to look at things by guarantor's employer. You know, who's the guarantor employer? And we wanna start sorting, should we approach Boeing for gallbladders? Should we, you know, should we approach them for C-section type? You know, hard to say, but we, we gotta have the data to do it. And we gotta be confident in the cost to go after it. You know, and of course, people still wanna see their general ledger, you know, and that's fine. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Let me go back one and talk about what I wanna be able to show here is, you know, most of the time when you're doing a cost accounting report, you'll get direct cost and indirect cost, maybe variable or fixed. But having that activity base, you can look at their supply, their drug, their labor, get all the way down to that. Speaking of the labor, I mentioned up front that I was going to tell you a story around the contract labor and the labor productivity. I live, as I mentioned, between Austin and San Antonio. It's a 130-bed hospital in my town. And I've known the CFO for, I don't know, 35 years, easy. And we were having tequila the other week. Shocking. And... Uh, I asked her about her contract labor situation. She goes, well, funny you say that, Mike. She goes, it's grown. And I heard them talk about that they missed the mark in the first two months on the contract labor at, at Evergreen. She goes, it, mine's, and I said, oh, really? Or what do you think you're doing about it? She goes, well, as long as it stays with, I might not do anything. And I went, okay, tell me more. And she said, well, yes, I'm paying double for that nurse or for that person diagnostician, whatever it happens to be, I'm paying 100% higher. But really, it's only 70% higher, because when I think about I have a, a nurse and I'm paying benefits, that's another 30%. So it's really only 70% higher. And I'm still thinking, you haven't sold me on this yet. You're, you're talking about I'm happy with 70% higher. And she said, I have 100% ability to flex that person down or up. I can come in at 2.15 and say I need to go home at 2.30. And their contract labor, yes, ma'am. And they walk out the door at 2.30. If I do that to my nurse, who's on staff, two or three times, that nurse may decide to drive the 30 miles to San Antonio and get a job at a hospital there. 
And so I don't have that flexibility per se as much with them. And those people are also residents in a small town and there's a, you know, the, a whole, you got rid of, you told, my, you told my husband he had to go home early, church, you know. It's, and she said, I've talked to other rural hospital places in Texas and there we're kind of okay because we can actually flex. So even though we're paying higher, we're trying to bring it back in terms of real productive time. And then she told me, she goes, but there is a downside. I was thinking, well, finally, if it's 70% higher, there's got to be a downside. She goes, my parking lot's got a problem. She goes, I have eight RVs in my parking lot for this rural hospital. It doesn't have a lot of parking space, kind of like this hotel. Um, I have eight RVs. It's, it's eight nurses living in their RV. They're traveling nurses. They're going around, you know, they're almost guns for hire, so to speak, you know. That'd be a Texas analogy, but they're, they're for hire, and they're going around the country, and they live in their RV and are working out of that. She goes, but guess what? The nice thing about them being right there in my parking lot is I can text them and say, oh God, we really need you, can you work another shift? And they're walking 50 feet and they're in the door. And so, again, it's having that data and that knowledge to kind of get you, you know, get you where you want to be in terms of knowing these things. And again, I still, you know, we got to do financial statements. I'm not getting around that. I, I asked the questions about rolling forecast earlier um, you're not going to get away from this, but can you imagine, because these are the actual expenses that you, every one of y'all have a financial statement every month, and, and it's your actual expenses versus a budget, whether that's a rolling forecast or a budget, not here to discuss that right now. My actual expenses that occurred for the month of February versus my budget. Can you imagine if you tried to present to your board, well, I'm just going to give you my average expenses for the last six to eight months. We'll call that the expenses for February. But you're doing that with your cost. And I think if the board knew it, they would say, well, why are you doing that for this and not? Just to show you that for those folks that really, it's every now and then I get asked this, this still, how the heck do you get it done? But we can literally, I mean, when I say we, they, not me anymore, can do explicit cost, and, and I, and, and, and I should say, I'm, I'm really beaten up on averages and RVUs and charge codes. But realistically, there are times when that makes perfectly good sense to use for costing. My wife's a speech therapist. If there's a 45 minute speech therapy charge, fine, I'll give it 47 minutes at an RVU. It's pretty much gonna be the average and it's pretty much gonna be right. I don't, I mean, it's not a lot of squeeze to do that juice for activity based, but come on, we can, we, and we can be sensible in terms of that. So there are times when that makes sense to do. Or if the dollar amount is not so significant that we have to, you know, look at that, we can, we can accept that. But for non-chargeable activity, for things that have big, big, you know, if I'm getting an MRI, I want that depreciation of that MRI going to every single individual patient that uses it based off the minutes in the MRI, not just an equal amount, but we'll know the minutes there in the MRI. It may, you know, I had a shoulder surgery and it took a long time to get me positioned in there. So they used up a lot of MRI time. And I felt like I was getting stuck like Pooh Bear. It, was not, it wasn't pleasant. But it used up a lot of that time and we need to allocate that and make sure we know that for when we're doing things. So, I'm going backwards here. Just to summarize, this is just to throw an eye test of people that are online. I, I truly believe that we, if you use some real activity-based costing, and I said there's about 70 hospitals across the nation that are doing it now, um, coast to coast. And oh, I mentioned around the world, and I'll, I'll finish up with that story as I re-hit my summary points. Our healthcare is kind of going this way compared to, not quality, just finance, compared to overseas. We are becoming more and more single payer I mean, if you take a look at between Medicare, Medicaid, for lack of a better word, Obamacare, you're approaching 70% of the, of the population. So that's at least predominantly one payer, government payer. The other 30% amongst self-pay and various insurance components. Go to Saudi Arabia, and up until five or six years ago, it was 100% government health care, one payer, the government. But... Now there, there are folks there, are folks there in, in England and Singapore, Guam I've worked with, 
uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, all of them are, there are private hospitals springing up. And in fact, <laughs> in, in Dubai, there are two brothers that each build a hospital. And one went to Oxford and hired the entire graduating medical school class. And the other one went to Cambridge and did the same thing and said, don't worry about residency. You'll do your residency with us. It's our country. We make the rules. And they opened a 150 bed to 175 bed hospital, built a compound for all the families to live in for all those physicians, did the same thing with the nurses, and then went back and got all their IT people from Cambridge and Oxford. But they have no experience in financially running a hospital. And they don't have charges. So they can't use virtually any of the costing systems that are out there because they're all charge code based. They, they, I mean, I literally came into Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi six or seven years ago and said, well, we could create dummy zero dollar charges. We'd have to and kind of create a fake billing system. So our cost accounting system would work for you. And they're like, I don't think so. You know, so they are actually loving the fact because they're all shocking on Epic or Cerner, pretty much Epic. Some Cerner. Um, that we, you know, that there's stuff that can tap into that and get to that activity-based costing. So they are moving more toward a private, <laughs> and we're moving toward more toward the other. Yet they are seeing the need. You know, they want to be able to, to manage their cost, and they're they're not necessarily having to manage their revenue because again, they're still not issuing a bill. So they're really having to focus on. They get a somewhat of an allocation from the government because they're siphoning off patients that the, the government hospitals don't have to take on. But they're still basically being funded by, you know, Sheik Jimmy and Sheik Janie um, handling this, you know, the, the brother and sister or brother and brother, whoever it is that's, that built the hospitals, you know, single owner. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna stop after this, go back to this last slide. The speed, the speed, the the juice has to be worth the squeeze. And it can't even, I don't care if the juice is, I think it's the best juice of all, but if, if the squeeze is too much. So it's gotta be automated. It's gotta be easy. It's gotta be trustworthy, which I think the fact that we're tapping into an EMR and not an arbitrary charge system gives us more data and more trustworthy data. And then we gotta use it to bolster our financial and clinical decision support. It can't be just financial. Think of the hysterectomy example where we brought in the complication data. And oh, by the way, there's a nice offshoot of this in terms of your labor productivity. I talked about Jimmy, the nurse, who was doing the phlebotomies on 8 North. Well, we should be able to, from a productivity perspective, start looking at individual employee productivity based off the activities that are happening via the EMR. And maybe not everything's in the EMR. We're not gonna know that Mike was the guy that had to come in and clean Janie's room three times because Janie threw up, because that wouldn't be in your EMR. It might, be nurse, it might be in nurse's notes, but it probably wouldn't be that, but the housekeeping people keep track of what rooms they, keep, they, they work on and how often they're there. So we could even get down to that. I was approached uh, two weeks ago by a hospital that wants us to come up with the productivity of their registration people and their billers. You know, what's the throughput for Gloria? How many registrations can Gloria do in an hour? Same thing in medical records. How many attestations, how much, you know, discharge complete medical records coding can Janie do in an hour? How much can Ralph do in terms of bills out the door in an hour? And then from a quality perspective, look at denials. If Ralph's getting more bills out, but he's got a much higher, deni his patients end up having a higher denial rate, is it Ralph? Or is it Ralph just drew, you know, just happened to draw patients and it ended up getting denials? And so you can play that productivity game because you've got that data. And you don't even need to have a activity-based cost accounting system to do any of the things I just said on labor productivity. You should be able to take that and throw it into an Excel spreadsheet or Access or Power BI, since that's what apparently is your flavor of the day there at Multicare and, and, and play that game and use it to your heart's content. So I have uh, pontificated for you know, 40 minutes on stuff right after lunch. Let me stop and see, are there any questions on the chat? I don't know, I wouldn't know how to know. I didn't think, nobody's gonna ask me a question on the chat. Yes, ma'am. I'm not on the chat, but I would like Well, you can chat with me.
Okay. So um, I will tell you that I've seen it's averaging about six to eight months to implement it, to get in, but that's not your question. I know that. Um, the clients I see doing this, um, the data is all in an uh, enterprise data warehouse. So the data is there. The software is generally embedded into the data warehouse, so there's not really an extraction. And most of the time, people that have an enterprise data warehouse are already bringing in all their EMR data anyway, so it's there. What's not generally there is general ledger and payroll data. So there is a, a, you know, a, a time to bring that in. That's hence my six to eight months why I brought it up to begin with. But you know, as opposed to a daily feed of, of big voluminous data, General Ledger is a much smaller file. Payroll's actually a larger file than GL because it's twice a month, unless you're monthly payroll. And it's, uh, you know, lot, it's more people involved in, in, in terms of records. Um, you know, one, one of the things I would advise if you really want to get to the productivity of this, and this would add a little extra, I don't know whether y'all make your contract labor employees badge in and badge out. I would. Because yes, you're going to get an invoice 45 days from now, but if you have them badge in and out, and pay them up, if, if you have to make the payroll system understand it, a penny an hour. And this way you can keep track that Mike was here from 8 to 2.30 when I got sent home by the CFO that I was talking about earlier. So I would have that data. But I've only seen this work in where the EMR is in an, a data warehouse that can be accessed. Um, and I see folks, depending upon, I mentioned flavor of the week, Torino, a little while ago. Um, you know, I see people using Power BI. I see people using Tableau. I see people using Click. Or in some cases, all the above at a single hospital because they have, I've got this group of, you know, data jockeys and they love Click. Fine. But if you can go against the data warehouse and do that, then that, that data is there. So then the other piece to your question, I'm giving you a lot longer answer than you probably wanted. Um, that how do I attach activity to cost? And there are a, an epic Cerner, even Meditech, um, I've been doing some consulting work with Women's Hospital in Baton Rouge and their Meditech hospital. There are areas of data that you can attach drivers to number of EKG tests and there's it's in the EKG portion of Epic or Cerner, and that will automatically come through and populate the number of tests. And then it's just, you know, it's not like you're coming to say, oh, I think it's 10 minutes that goes to that test. Then the documentation is, Gloria did that for, for Mike Andrews, and Gloria spent seven minutes, and Gloria's getting paid $10 an hour. And so do the math of seven minutes to 10. I can't do that that fast, I'm not that good. Um, and so we know that cost for that. So that all happens, that part all happens automatically. What I have found is that, and this is not going to be a shock to anybody in the room, nobody has the same instance of Epic, nobody has the same instance of Cerner, maybe they have the same instance of Meditech, frankly. Um, and so what kind of comes out of the box within four to six months, then there's usually about a month and a half of adjustment because, I just had one the other week where they said, well, you're, show, you're showing us no labor for respiratory therapy. Every respiratory therapy test has zero dollars in labor. Really? So then we find out, well, guess what? The respiratory therapy department and the, I'll make it up, EKG department are being managed by one person and they paid all the employees out of EKG, cost center. So the mapping that would normally we would have, somebody would have, oh, the labor in respiratory therapy does the respiratory therapy activity, the labor in EKG. So we just had to find out who the employees were and point them back over. And so there's, a, there's always an adjustment. And that was, that was actually not an Epic or Cerner, that was a GL payroll thing. But then there's also the, you know, sometimes there's a revenue department and there's a, a expense department. And so there's some, there's some things there that have to happen. But uh, generally, the only one that's taken a whole lot longer is, is uh, that I've seen the more than four to six months is some of the international clients. But I think that some of that is just culture and still not great, great data beyond the EMR that, you know, the, the other problem, I was told at Saudi German hospital, I'll say it, but 
Um, well, you know, our, our, our nurses make $12,000 a year. I go, and I said, well, understand, housing's free. <laughs> Gas is cheap there. They haven't hit, they, <laughs> they haven't hit what we've hit in the last, you know, month. Um, uh, okay, so there's not a, you know, they're all about supplies because there's not a lot of needle to move there on the labor, so their hair is not on fire as much, maybe, if I say it that way. So, other questions? I, I mentioned them, so I, I will repeat that they are. Um, MedStar in DC is really starting to come on, I've seen. Uh, Freightert in Milwaukee. Uh, let me think, uh, John Muir down the coast in Sacramento. Renown in Reno. I'm doing some interesting work with Oklahoma Heart Hospital. Shockingly, they're in Oklahoma City. And there are two 65-bed heart hospitals, one on the north side and one on the south side. And just based off financial statements, and I don't think I'm giving too much away here, one's much more profitable than the other, and they're trying to figure out because it's the same medical staff. Now, there's a slightly different payer, but what we're finding is big differences in supply. Two different supply chain managers or in two different sets of medical supplies, and some more expensive than the other. But those are ones that just off the top of my head that I think I can get away with saying who they are, they won't mind. Another one, uh, as far as um, in your experience over years, I don't know, as far as you look at your case study, have you had, um, I'm sure your examples, whatever, the position of you know, your cert product or higher cost and everything, what, is there any success stories of them actually showing them in data and saying, yeah, this is a better way to go? Oh, you show them and they still may say, too bad, I'm using my thing, right. and, and I, I, oh boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this definitely anonymous hospital. So what the hospital did is, okay, that's what you're gonna do, fine, but you know that, that new professional office building we're building with the connected, connected bridge? Yeah, I don't think we have any space for you to rent there. You know, or we won't give you, or you'll have to pay rent, we're not giving you the space. Because that's a, I mean, I'll just say, that's a big, in Texas, you cannot own physicians but you can give them a free office you know, and free staff, but you can't own the physician there. And it's kind of a right to work thing. I don't know what it is. They could go work, you know, they can be on staff, but they can't, you can't make them exclusive. You can't own them. So a lot of that financial uh, blackmail <laughs> is being done via inducements like that. But I, I still see some physicians Say, I'm still, I've never had a quality problem doing it this way, and I'm not going to start now risking my patients. And then you just have to say, okay, I understand that. And I, I, my other way to mitigate the risk is if that, that doctor is doing, I'll go back to cataracts, let's go get some more op ophthalmologists that maybe they'll take market share away from me who's not going to change my ways. You know, or it's just not significant enough that you want to fight the battle. You know. Anything else? Because I'm my leprechaun here is telling me I need to qu get quiet. All right. Thank you so much for having me up. It was an easy trip up from Orlando yesterday. I was at Hims, which was a train wreck. That's on camera. <laughs> and uh, look forward to talking and seeing y'all soon. Thank Appreciate you. it.